So Sean, I now come to the most exciting portion of the interview where I get to ask my own existential questions that we call the fantastic four or the quintessential quattro. I think that if you have quintessential, it should be five questions. <laughs> That's yes, what quintessence means. Should. So alliteration <laughs> is trumped by numerical accuracy. Yeah. Good. You're the, you're the perfect person to point out that error. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to break and do uh, these questions. All right. These are questions I ask you about existential meaning and reality of uh, yourself, advice to your former self, and what you think is going to happen in the future, kind of loosely related to uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke's various laws. Okay, the first one comes uh, down to the following. When you depart this mortal coil, uh, and you're one of the few physicists that quotes from Shakespeare and some of his papers, uh, I find that uh, quite delightful. Uh, but as you spring forth at the biblical ordained age for the righteous, 120 years old, the age Moses got to when he failed to reach the promised land. What do you want to put in your ethical will, not your material will? It's a concept in Hebrew known as the Zava'ah. It's basically the wisdom or teachings you want to pass on, not just to your biological heirs, of which you don't have any as far as I know. We'll get to that maybe. Uh, but to your ideological heirs, of which you undoubtedly have millions around the world. What advice, ethically or wisdom-based, would you like to give? You know, it's always a, I, I'm torn because I don't think advice works, but I think it's kind of necessary to give it. You know, I mean, I think that you, advice doesn't work because some wise person says something and some other person goes, oh, that's true, I will do it. That's not just not, that's the paradigm, but that's a failure for how advice works. Advice works if and only if it inspires you to think in a deeper way way right like you go well you know maybe i don't agree with that but i see why they would say that and let me let me think about it and you know maybe that's the advice i would give um there's lots of different things that i think are true the my usual piece of advice is to young people um don't wait for life to happen to you just think about what you want your life to be and go out and get it and of course this is I'm I'm preemptively giving the advice that I would give to my younger self because that's what I that's what I think is important. Like what I wish someone had told me. Like I was very good at obeying the rules and doing what I was supposed to do and taking classes I was supposed to take and things like that. But I just you know let the various parts of my education, my career, come to me rather than shaping them actively myself. And mm. I wish I had done more of the latter. Mm. Very good. Well. Um... Sean, you don't have to answer this question, um, but uh, I'm gonna see if it's uh, if it's if it's not inappropriate to ask you. I don't think you guys have kids, and I'm wondering was that a conscious decision? Is that based on anything? Again, if you don't want to answer it, we don't have to. We can cut this all out. But the fact that you didn't have children or don't have them is that was that was that by by choice or or was it not? Yeah, no, it's clearly by choice. It wasn't a mistake <laughs> or it wasn't I mean, because adopt, of right? <laughs> biological uh, impossibility. Jennifer herself is adopted. Yeah, right. uh, so that was always a possibility. Um, but it, so I actually just got asked this question on a recent ask me anything episode of Mindscape. And so I did answer it. Oh, and I haven't gotten through the whole catalog yet. No problem. But what I like to do is distinguish between this sort of a personal aspect and a universal moral aspect right and i won't go into what the personal aspects are they're not that interesting but my point is there's no universal moral aspect for us like jennifer and i did decide not to have kids but not because we think that was some moral imperative it's bad to have kids you know we're anti-natalists or anything like that it's mostly because we were busy and we had things to do and the things that we were most interested in doing did not involve raising children. We love other people's children. We think it's great when they have them. Go for it. I'm a pluralist in having kids like I am about many things. I think that some people should have them. Some people shouldn't. And everyone should respect each other's choices. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, OK, getting back to the Arthur C. Clarke framed questions. There's a question that actually pertains to your former desk that you had at Caltech. Unless you brought it with you, that desk behind you looks too new to be Feynman's desk. Yeah. But um, uh, so Arthur famously said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, and 
I, I like to tie this question into, um, you know, kind of the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, where there's these primates, these proto-humans on the savannah in Africa, and they come upon this monolith and they kind of like hit it with a bone and they do all sorts of things with it. Uh, but I want to ask you um, now to look deeper than 120 years into the future, into your crystal ball and ask, what would you put on a monolith if it was sort of a billion year lasting time capsule? I'll remind you, uh, Feynman answered this. He would write the atomic hypothesis. Um, what would you put in or on, you know, besides a CD-ROM, uh, you can't put that on, but what it, would you put to brag to aliens or whoever finds us billion years from now, have a little swagger about humanity? What do you think you'd put uh, to captivate the magic of our technology? You know, It's an almost impossible question to take seriously. I know what you mean. I know I know the story of Feynman saying, you know, everything is made of atoms. But I mean, was he just writing those words in English? Is that could it be supposed to be helpful to people a million years from now? Uh, that seems implausible. So probably you would want to draw a picture of something, I guess, right? I mean, you could draw a picture of the periodic table of the elements. That might be a good thing. Um, I would even better love to draw a picture of the second law of thermodynamics or general relativity or something like that. But I don't know how to get those across in a simple, very good picture. So I think that Feynman might have been right, you know, um, to think about matter as made of discrete units, even though that's not fundamentally true, but it's a stepping stone to understanding things better. If I, if I could somehow get an abstract concept across, it would be something like conservation of momentum. Like I talk about in, in the book, I think that realizing the universe can run by itself, that left to its own devices, things would just continue on at, the, at a constant speed. That's really what opens up modern physics, modern in the last 500 years, I mean <laughs> modern. Uh, and so that's the one thing I would like to get across. I just don't know how to do it in a picture. Yes. All right. Very good. Okay. You already answered my uh, third law, Arthur C. Clarke's third law of the only way of finding the limits of the possible is to venture beyond them into the impossible. That's the name of the podcast. So we'll skip to the final question, uh, which is a statement that Sir Arthur made. He said, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, they are most certainly right. When they say that something is impossible, they are very probably wrong. I'm not calling you old, Sean, but um, what, if anything, have you changed your mind on um, in your work or in life? Well, let's first notice that this statement by Arthur C. Clarke is complete BS. <laughs> it's just equivalent logically to saying anything is possible, right? <laughs> yeah, it's not really a very helpful statement, and it's certainly there's no empirical evidence behind it. It's right. just a way I think of, it's like, that there's a bit of smugness that comes it's sometimes. Just, yeah, right. Yes, and I think that Arthur C. Clarke is being smug when he yeah. makes that statement a little bit. So that, right. Including like, this statement is, is yes, wrong. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, I've changed my mind on lots of things, you know, I mean, the, the existence of a non-zero cosmological constant is something that I changed my mind about, you know, science is great for that, because um, you do change your mind, uh, you're forced to by the data, right? Um, I, I changed my mind about philosophical things, I used to be a moral realist, I'm not anymore, I used to be utilitarian, I'm not anymore. Uh, I've changed my mind about what are interesting questions in physics, you know, um, because you do have to, I mean, interesting questions are ones that are not only ones you want the answer to, but ones you think you can make progress answering. And I've, I've learned a lot more as I've, I've grown in age and wisdom about what I think I can make progress answering. Uh, so yeah, all sorts of things. And, and I don't even remember them because I'm very good at just eat, eat internalizing the new wisdom and just pretending that I was been like that all along. If it weren't for published papers, <laughs> Papers, I would think that I'd never change my mind. <laughs> That's right. You can find Sean at Retraction Watch. Every yeah. week. Um, so maybe the last qu question, Sean, if um, if money were no object, um, what would the Mindscape project look like? What would your podcast look like? Um, what would your kind of, um, how would it change things besides, you know, your G650, um, which I assume you're going to get by proximity to the powers, uh, the halls of power <laughs> in Washington, DC. How would you, how would the, just focus on the podcast, maybe. How would you do things differently if, if you had unlimited funds almost to dedicate towards this project? 
Well, I but not think unlimited that, time. Not unlimited time. Well, I, that's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, the bottleneck is time m more than money. Um, you know, the spirit of Mindscape has always been uh, a shoestring budget. <laughs> it's you know, I'm not going to put too much time or money into it. I did you know splurge on a nice recording device and some nice microphones. Um, and I realized you know that now that most of my interviews are remote, it's very hard to control the guests' audio. You know that's a that's a whole thing. If I had unlimited funds, I would promise to you know fly the guests to a real studio and feed them caviar if they would be interested in doing this. And so I would get much better audio quality. Quality. But otherwise, that's mostly it. You know, I think that the given what the spirit of the podcast is, money is not going to be that helpful. You know, um, I would I would give back all the money to the Patreon supporters and, and, and not take ads, I guess. But like even the Patreon supporters, you know, they're giving money. I think that what they get out of it as being part of a community is more than like, oh, I get an ad free version of the podcast, you know, and even with the ads, I get a lot of people saying, you know, could you include links to your advertisers on your website? Because because some of them I actually want, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so I'm, I've started doing that. If you go to preposterousuniverse.com slash podcast on the sidebar, I actually include links to the advertisers where you can get your 15 percent off Mindscape discount uh, and things like that that so there's not a lot that i would change i think it's a pretty good system yeah no it's working very well uh sean i want to thank you and congratulate you on a number you know of of different uh, items but especially on your new book um you know, the biggest ideas in the universe volume one space time matter motion uh it's a wonderful accessible book i'm actually using it for one of my um, middle schoolers at home to learn about calculus and it's Excellent. a little advanced for him to learn about uh special relativity although he did have a lecture from uh, jim gates uh in person when i was back at brown on uh, supersymmetry uh but i want to congratulate <laughs> you on this book which he followed and he, he got yeah. some uh, some good pointers um I want to, uh, yeah, congratulate you on this wonderful accomplishment and uh, and the great success. Wish you great success there on the East Coast, close to the halls of power. May you be a, a, a physicist on a hill there and influence the, the country towards uh, the betterment of all mankind. Thank you, Sean, so much. My pleasure. And, you know, keep on uh, the spirit flying there in Southern California with the surfing and the sunshine, which I know is, is your big deal. So yeah. uh, we'll miss enjoy you. that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Bye-bye. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic.